guests, ladies and gentlemen. The Great Circle is the longest and most demanding race in the Australian program, a race which requires well-found vessels and fit and experienced crews. It is our hope that it will realise its potential to be re recognised as one of the great and challenging events in the yachting calendar. Second on corrected time, Ocean Racing Club of Victoria Trophy, second in Division 1, third on arbitrary handicap, superstar Keith Farthorn. <laughs> I'd like to thank the sponsors very much for putting on the race. I'd also like to thank Peter Kane, who did a great deal to keep the boat going while I was consulting an oracle in the bottom of a bucket. <laughs> Line honours, Golden Fleece Petroleum Trophy, and third in Division One, Siska Rolitaska. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, yachtsmen all, um, I'm delighted to be able to come back again this year um, after the wonderful experience of the race last, last summer. Um, as you know, it was a particularly hard race once again. First on corrected time, State of Victoria Trophy, Challenge, Lou Abrahams. Sunday, the 13th of January, 1980, was hardly the average summery day at Portsea on the southern end of Port Phillip Bay. For the thousands of people who turned out to watch the start of Australia's longest and most challenging yacht race, it was a case of trying to stay dry and warm. But such comforts were the furthest things from the minds of the crews of the yachts entered in the Golden Fleece Great Circle Yacht Race. Yachts of all sizes would take their crews over 800 miles around Tasmania, non-stop, to finish at Flinders on Western Port Bay. Well, I suppose it'll be one of the, uh, uh, the, the last of the big adventures that one can participate in as a, uh, as a city person. And uh, we get a lot of sort of satisfaction out of doing this sort of thing. Uh, there's, uh, we're one of the three smallest boats in the race, so um, the only time we're going to see Siska is between here and the, uh, and the heads. I think it's a far better test of sailing than, than the other, other races around Australia because, uh, one, you, um, you go around uh, an island like Tasmania where you've got four corners and every, at every corner we seem to have a wind change and uh, different weather patterns and this is excellent for learning um, more about sailing than, than what such as a Sydney Hobart is where you, uh, you just uh, go out of the heads and you just go south for two days. You know, I think it's a wonderful race. I think it, it could be a little bit on the dangerous side if we got uh, very strong winds around Meitsega. But the boats today are very seaworthy and they're becoming more so all the time. And the weather is um, it's quite acceptable to all the modern boats. We have uh, quality in this fleet. We, uh, some very good boats. We have Siska, the winner of the previous boat circle, the inaugural one. And we have Lou Abrams Challenge, which is a brand new Spartan and Stevens yacht, and she's proved herself. She's won the King of the Derwent race after the Sydney Hobart, and I predict a great future for her in ocean racing. And uh, as we go down, you've got Superstar, who represented Australia in the Admiral's Cup two years ago. We have a, a good fleet for a, an interesting race. We are a little smaller than some other boats, but we will be right with them. If it's very windy, um, well, it's physically tough. If it's if it's light winds, um, it's mentally tough. You know, you you've got to keep concentrating for days on end, and it's difficult. 
I've done a lot of the various ocean races around the world. Mate, this is a very demanding one. It's one that I was a bit critical of when I was chairman of the VYC Safety Committee, and I think it's good to go and have a look at it. Whether I'll feel that way if it's 60 knots on the nose around the bottom, I don't know. Uh, both at this weight, uh, we would get wind speeds to continue 15 to 25 knots. So I think a bit of luck would go well. That's what we're after. I think with a little bit of bloom and luck, we'll be there. And if it drive on, drive on, no matter what. With an hour to the start, thousands of holidaymakers were packing onto Portsy Pier and onto boats. It was virtually a repeat of the start of the 1979 race, which was the inaugural Great Circle. That had been a complete triumph for the new maxi yacht Siska, owned and skippered by West Australian Roly Tasker. He had taken both line and handicap honours in a fleet of crack yachts, and in 1980, he was out to break the record he'd set then. <laughs> Crews keep a sharp eye on the wind as they rig their craft. The southerly of 15 to 20 knots guarantees a quick trip from the start to the heads where the yachts enter the notorious Bass Strait and make for northeast Tasmania to begin their circumnavigation. <laughs> Guests pack the restored topsail schooner Alma Dopal, which is anchored at the seaward end of the line and is the official starting boat. The 10 minutes before the start are crucial to the manoeuvring crews. Ideally, each yacht wants to be on its own without having its wind taken by other yachts and to hit the line at top speed as the gun fires. To be late gives the opposition an early break and to hit the line early means sailing back around to recross the line while the fleet sails off into the distance. The seconds tick away, and tension mounts as the skippers try to get their yacht's position for that ideal start. Superstar nears the Alma Dobel at the leeward end of the line and looks good until Siska makes a daring tack and grabs her wind. Right out, hard on there. Let's get him going. Challenge is at the other end of the line, further inshore. At one stage, she was early and had to bear away. But now, skipper Lou Abrahams has her out on her own and well positioned, as is Siska down to Lewitt with Tasker at the helm. Up you go. Randy. The wind direction gives skippers a tough decision over whether they'll be able to hoist their spinnakers. Most have them ready as the final countdown and final dash to the line begins. gambles for a small spinnaker as Siska leads the fleet across the line. Each member of the 13-man crew has his hands full as they work the 76-foot maxi. Patrol boats keep the spectator fleet back as they struggle to set the spinnaker on the way to the heads and bass straight. Most of the fleet is content with their working rigs. The crack 34-footer Aquila tries a spinnaker, but like Siska, is forced to drop it before long. Keith Farfour's superstar holds third place behind Siska and Challenge. The South Australian sloop Pivot is close behind, but Superstar keeps disturbing her wind, and she's in the box seat. As the yachts approach Bass Strait, they begin shortening sail as they leave the protection of land. Lighter winds have been forecast, and while most yachtsmen place little faith in weathermen, they still put everything into it with this breeze. Siska's crew is a well-knit team, some of them having been on board for over 30,000 miles of racing all over the world. 
The heads to Port Phillip Bay have claimed several vessels and lives since the first ship, the Lady Nelson, passed through them in 1802. And these skippers carefully choose their courses. As soon as she has room, Siska goes about and heads for the northeast of Tasmania. Behind, the smaller yachts find it tougher going. With the thrill of the start and the race to the heads out of the way, now it's down to business and the challenge of racing more than 800 miles through waters including the Roaring Forties. Four hours later at the first radio schedule, the fleet was working along the Victorian coast near Cape uh, Shank. 20 knots, um, seems to be moderating a little and um, nice bright sunny afternoon. Five one one four five one five challenge three eight four three one four five zero four superstar three eight four six one four five zero five vivid eight four three one four five zero four windfire three eight but the wind was dying and by late afternoon, it had swung to the northeast, enabling the yachts like Siska to head further south and straight for Bank Strait, off Tasmania's northeast. Crews found themselves having to constantly adjust sail settings to make the most of the varying breeze. Yeah, gotcha. As night fell, Siska was well in front of Superstar and Challenge with the light breeze seeing Bass Strait in a tame mood. Siska was designed, built and rigged by Rolly Tasker himself. Built in 1978, she set new standards for maxi yachts with her lightweight design. Below deck, she's almost luxurious. Well, we, we always eat well. We've got a uh, very fine galley in the centre of the boat and we've got good cooking facilities and um, we have a roster for cooking and we have a washing up roster. Everyone takes, has their share, including myself. Superstar is 30 feet shorter than Siska and the crew comforts are hardly identical. But sunrise on the second day found her lying second on the Bass Strait crossing, just a few miles ahead of Challenge. Both yachts as well as Siska were well past the halfway mark to northeast Tasmania, with Superstar leading easily on handicap. At this early stage, she had really thrown down the gauntlet. Sisko is 55 miles from Bank Strait, where she could turn south to begin rounding Tasmania. Overnight, she'd averaged only six knots, and with the wind expected to fade further throughout the day, she was in a poor position in her attempt to break her race record. As the wind died away, most of the off-watch crew worked on their suntans while those on watch were frustrated as they handled the big yacht with a light touch to coax her through the water. As the fleet was spread over about 50 miles, fortunes varied in the fluctuating breezes. Superstar stayed further north than Siska and managed to keep moving through the day with all hands making the most of the light airs in their effort to close with Superstar. Later in the morning and within sight of the Tasmanian landmass, Siska was well and truly becalmed. Carrying a lightweight ghost of foresail, she could only make enough way through the water to be pointing in the right direction. She was going nowhere. Cisco was designed to fly in heavy winds and in light airs she's a comparatively poor performer. And it was weather like this that had turned the preceding Sydney to Hobart into a race for small yachts. Cisco crossed the line third in that race, frustrated by conditions she was now experiencing in the same latitudes. 
Navigators keep careful checks on their positions. For safety, race rules provide that three times a day, the yachts must radio their positions to Des Cooper's 60-foot motor launch, Lotus Eater, that escorts the fleet throughout. The Lotus Eater then radios the positions to officials of the Ocean Racing Club of Victoria at race headquarters in Melbourne. Here, Superstar was well placed. It's been a very interesting race to date in that we started uh, in the normal fairly sheltered water off Port Sea Pier, moving into a great deal of breeze and we went outside where we had a lot of sail changes as the wind uh, varied and according to sea strength. Then coming down into Bass Strait, the classical pattern we've come to expect down in Victoria. Um, dying out to almost nothing at the moment, an exercise in frustration. Uh, Lou Abrams in challenge just over, over there, who is also hanging on and, and going well. Um, I would expect <clears throat> this weather to hold for about another five or six hours before we get uh, a bit more breeze, which I think will be uh, southerly, leading to a beach running down the Tasmanian coast, which should suit us. It will suit the bigger boats challenge also, leave the little fellas a bit behind, which is only fair after the Sydney Hobart. And um, a bit of quietness down around Matsuka Island, perhaps, <clears throat> and a northerly coming up the west coast of Tasmania. We've got to expect a lot of quiet weather as we get back up towards Bass State, because that's typical of the weather pattern at this time of year. <clears throat> it's a long time to say how we'll go. It seems that the optimists are for Friday morning and the pessimists are for opening time on the Saturday but it's still 610 odd miles to go, so we've got the equivalent of a Sydney Hobart before we finish, and a hell of a lot can happen. Like the rest of the fleet, Superstaff kept up all possible sail to catch the varying breeze. 50 miles from Swan Island and Bank Strait, she carried 430 square feet in her mainsail, 2,000 square feet in her biggest spinnaker, and 950 square feet in her blooper. That's over 3,300 square feet of sail for a speed of just two or three knots. and Siska finally had enough breeze to pass through Bank Strait and around Swan Island with the lighthouse marking the turn south. The off-watch skipper was called from sleeping below as the crew prepared to alter course and ready themselves for the hours of nightfall ahead. For Siska, like all great circle entrants, the rounding of Swan Island marked the first important landmark of the race. And now it was time to pray for the wind to come up to make up for the slow times of that day. Prayers for strong winds were answered with credit when a gale hit the fleet overnight. Dawn found rimfire through Bank Strait and heading south in fourth position. The 50 to 60 knot winds and huge seas saw her surfing as she kept on a lot of sail area. But it was to be too much, as later she fell off a wave, cracking a bulkhead and being forced to retire. Passing through Bank Strait, the smallest yacht in the fleet, Moran Du, was well placed, but also heading for retirement. She'd broken her main boom during the night and had to withdraw into the shelter of Swan Island. The 38-footer Shenandoah capsized soon after this film was taken. Skipper Ron White. Over we went, we broached and went over. Our mast went further and further down. Realised the only way to get her up was to cut the number one free, which we did. In the meantime, the navigator went overboard. Eventually, he got back on board and uh, one of the crew said, we didn't want to lose you, we're glad to see you back on board. He said, don't worry, I had no intention of leaving. John Lake's Dorado was down to half a mainsail, but she was still surfing and giving the crew the ride of a lifetime. Eastern morning was down to just a jib, but the storm had torn her sails badly and her crew had to shelter and spend 24 hours repairing sails before resuming the race. Well south, spray crashed over the length of Superstar as her wind indicator went off the clock at 60 knots. The gale had gone against the blue hulled veteran as Challenge had passed her after they rounded Swan Island.
below decks, life became miserable as off-watch crewmen had to sleep in wet weather gear to stay dry. In this kind of weather, it doesn't matter what the yacht is, it will be wet down below, and the crew will be wet, wherever they are. Water slops around the cabin, bunks and sleeping bags are damp, and some crew members are seasick. The storm found Siska rounding Tasman Island on the southeast of Tasmania. The strong winds had forced the crew to take off the mainsail and replace it with the much smaller trisail to keep the boat from being overpowered. As on all yachts, the crew on deck wore safety harnesses to attach themselves to the boat. In such rough conditions, it's possible for any crewman to be thrown overboard and the harness should save them. Such conditions were nothing new to the crew of the Maxi yacht. They'd sailed through similar winds to finish third in the previous year's Fastnet race in England, where a violent storm took 15 lives. The next day, Jock Starrock, chairman of the race organising committee, took to the air by helicopter off Tasmania's south coast to check the fleet. Starrock's had a lifetime of ocean racing, including two challenges for the America's Cup in Gretel and Dame Patty. The continuing bad weather kept the helicopter below 100 feet, and it was difficult searching for the yachts with visibility down to a couple of miles. Finally, southwest of Hobart, Challenge appeared out of the gloom, lying second in the fleet. 120 miles behind Siska and just nine miles ahead of Superstar. In big seas, she had plenty of wind. She's got quite a bit of breeze down there. She's got three reefs in the night for a number four head for long, so she hasn't got much bow and she's carrying it very nicely. Right, Moving have... along at six and a half to seven knots. Let's have a close look at it, Jock. Uh, describe the boat. It's a new boat, isn't it? Yeah, it's a new Spartan Stevens design yacht. 46 feet in length overall. She's only launched in December of this year and it's been going very well. There's five on deck, you can see, and uh, the other five would be down below off what? You can see the size of the seas that she's heading into there. Uh, they seem to be more head on than what the wind is. And uh, they'll be holding her back. You watch when she hits this sea now. See that, Rick? Bounces into that one. Look at this one coming now. You see that? Yep. And then bang, into a hole. You don't have to be silly, but it's a great help. All these sails look to be intact, and he seems to be sailing along very nicely. Come off watch, and they'll go down and change some dry clothes, and then have a sleep, and then they're ready for the next one. Right. Probably be four hours on and four hours off. Yep. You see the seas that she's heading into now? Yep. They're rather large out yep. here. As I said before, she's not making heavy weather at the all. She's handling it the conditions very well. There's a decent sea. When you think the boat is 46, 47 feet long, it gives you an idea. The mast is over 60 feet. It gives you an idea of the size of the sea. The going was certainly hard, with the headwinds giving the crews no let up. In the poor conditions, it took some searching to find Superstar further inshore than Challenge and tacking along the coastline. She's a 46 foot long Peterson sloop and was a member of the Admiral's Cup team in England in 1977. She's carrying more sail up uh, in front of the mast. Yeah, she's challenge. got a bigger head for than Challenge had, and, uh, but a smaller mainsail. Uh, I think Challenge seemed to be handling these conditions a bit better than what uh, we see Superstar doing right now. Right. Is this the sort of weather Superstar would like? Yeah, she goes well in a breeze. Yeah. Uh, and particularly well in uh, light weather. But, uh, oh, she's a good boat. She's come right in shore, Doc, which is what uh, you thought would be happening uh, for you. Well, well, I think that when we were looking for them out to sea, they were probably working right up along this coast. Right. Uh, and when you get in closer, what she is doing, you'll find that the seas are much smaller and smoother water, yeah. and this makes the boat star much better. Dorado had to retire when her mast broke after the storm off the east coast and her crew motored to Hobart. Oh, I was gusting sort of over 50 uh, in Bank Strait, yeah. but uh, by the time this happened, it wasn't blowing hard at all. Had it dropped out? Had it gone. What and sort of uh, strength would it have been blowing when she went? Oh, 
Yeah. 30 knots. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, we weren't over late at all. Did it go over the side? Yes, yeah, so it went over the side. We were right close in, you know. We, <laughs> the guy in the helm missed his opportunity. He didn't get the chance to say, all hands on deck. He sort of <laughs> just yelled everybody up. And the mast hanging over the side, and we got a couple of picks out. No, it's very, very substantial and strong rig that was checked over in extreme detail before we left Melbourne. Well, I'm quite surprised it fell over the side. We had a double reef and a number three on, and it was, uh, I suppose, uh, 25 to 35. I, I would say, uh, but the wind was at that stage moderating. Uh, but uh, when she dropped over the side, we were in front of Shenandoah, which was in sight, and Eastern Morning, which was in sight, and Morandu at the time. It was a oh, ripper sail through Bank Strait, you know, the all the water on either side. Well back on the east coast, Sturrock found another close tussle between Shenandoah, Aquila and Bow and Billy in somewhat easier conditions. Yes, close hold on the port tack standing down, you can see in the background the Tasman light. And I was sailing, I would estimate the breeze to be about 25 to 30 knots. It'd be a nice uh, bit of relief for the crew after that blow through back straight. Yeah, they seem to have come through very well though. There doesn't seem to be any damage at all to the boat. Uh, you can see she's got two reefs in her number three headsail. And that's uh, Ron White, the owner, skipper, Commodore of Sandringham Yacht Club, is at the helm right now. Yeah, she just changed hands. She's got a new owner and a new crew aboard. My word, that jib looks like it could be trimmed in a bit better. Uh, but she's sailing very nicely. She's another Sparkman and Stevens design, and she's handling those conditions well. And another veteran now, uh, Aquila, been winning a lot of races on handicap. Yeah, Aquila's one of the famous S&S uh, &S 34s, Sparkman and Stevens design. Actually, she's a sister ship to uh, Ted Heath's boat, Morning Cloud, which won the Sydney Hobart race. Moving along there. Yeah, uh, three reefs and a number two headsail. And, uh, quite a good breeze, as you can see, but these little boats are at their best in a hard breeze to win it. Wednesday morning found Siska around the southwest of Tasmania and with ideal conditions for the first time in the Great Circle. The strong southwesterly allowed her crew to ease sheets and power along. In fact, into first place on handicap and with an excellent chance of breaking the record. Tasket won more than 30 state and Australian championships in 44 years. In the 1956 Olympics, he tied for a gold medal, but was put back to a silver on a count back. This sailing is exhilarating but hard work, requiring 100% concentration. Tasker, called RLT by his crew, is highly respected by the crew that he drives hard at all times. I'm a watch captain and I have another watch captain, which means that um, I'm on the helm almost for three hours and then the, we have another watch. And if we change sails, everyone's on deck and I'll take over the wheel for the change of sails. There's no excuses, so we, we're just, uh, we're, we race the boat very hard at all times. Rounding Matsika Island off the southwest of Tasmania later, Superstar's crew has an extra burden with trouble aloft. A halyard block is giving problems, and the only way to sort it out is to go up there by bosun's chair. As Siska makes her way up the west coast, the weather is warming up and life on board returns to normal. Matsika and heading north, Challenge continued to do well, vying with Siska for handicap honours. 
She was launched only two months earlier. Designed by the famous American firm of Sparkman and Stevens, she was named Challenge because skipper Lou Abrahams couldn't find a boat builder to build her in aluminium in time for the important Southern Cross series off Sydney. So he had to organise it himself. Only days after she was launched, she was racing and won a place in the Victorian team. In Sydney, she turned out to be the top Victorian yacht. Non-stop racing before the Golden Fleece Great Circle meant Challenge still needed work on her to make life easier for the crew below decks. It was quite uh, moist down there. We had a lot of condensation uh, after the second or third day because the yacht wasn't, or well, isn't completed actually at the present time and uh, we're still putting ventilators, etc., into the yacht. So we, uh, we didn't have a lot of ventilation coming through. Thursday afternoon placed Siska with 100 miles to go, with 170 miles to challenge and just 9 miles to superstar off the southwest coast. Attention now focused on Siska as headwinds and an adverse tide slowed her progress as she left Tasmania and re-entered Bass Strait. To beat her record, she would have to average 7.03 knots, a difficult task. and I've got a copy of Challenge. Uh, Sister, please confirm your position. 4011 14453. Yeah, Romeo. And I've also got Challenge. Uh, challenge at 4225 14511. Uh, thanks, Sister. Um, copy Challenge position 4225. One four five one one. Is that a Romeo? Romeo. Uh, thanks, Mr. Many thanks. It was all stops out as the crew strive for every knot of speed. It wasn't looking too good for a new record, and Tasker estimated their arrival at Flinders at eight o'clock the next morning, a time outside the record. But anything can happen in yachting, and they weren't out of it yet. Race control to low to cedar. Low to cedar, here is race control. How are you copy now, over? Uh, that's much better, Warwick, much better. Um, you ready to give the case the report? Certainly am. Fire away. Uh, Romeo, Aquila. As Lotus Eater relayed the positions, race officials plotted Siska's trip to the finish. In the inaugural Golden Fleece Great Circle, she had sailed the course in four days, 19 hours, 32 minutes and 23 seconds. To beat that record, she would have to cross the finish line at Flinders before 5.32 the next morning. At this stage, it was an even money bet, with the wind the deciding factor. Officials estimated her arrival at 7 a.m., and the news media and the public clamoured for details. The Great Circle Yacht Race is very popular with the public who follow the yacht's progress closely and then flock to Flinders for the finish. Yeah, that's not a, not a real gale. Um, OK, you'll be back to me in 15 for the... Um Handicaps, over. Uh, affirmative, um, but the coastal poor reports all around the island that uh, coming from different directions and different winds. Siska finally caught most people unawares. She'd had favourable winds overnight, and at seven minutes to five, she crossed the finishing line at Flinders in Western Port Bay. She'd finally done it, finishing two hours earlier than expected, and she'd broken her record by just 39 minutes and 22 seconds. And that was after 800 miles and all types of conditions, from flat calms in Bass Strait to a southerly buster in the Roaring Forties during their time of four days and just less than 19 hours. 
Even at the early hour, people watched from the pier as Siska anchored and received some very welcome visitors. This was one of the few races where Rowley's wife Sarah and their six-year-old daughter Sophie had not been part of the crew. As well as helping work the boat when she sails, Sarah is invaluable as she handles all the organisation necessary to keep the big yacht racing. Gang! Where's my man? Have a beer. For the crew, there's a tremendous feeling of elation when they start packing the gear away and ride at anchor. They've faced the challenge and won. Their average speed in the Great Circle had been a fraction under seven knots. Doesn't matter, I'll find it, JP. It's probably down below somewhere. Here we go, fellas. Cheers. Cheers, mate. As the mainsail is furled, it's time to relax and unwind and look forward to sleeping in a warm and dry bed that is not moving all the time. No more rude awakenings with someone shouting for everyone to go on deck for a sail change. Now it's time for a break. But soon they'll be back at it again, and they wouldn't swap. For Rolly, the second great circle had everything. The race was very light for the first day and a half, and then we, we got down the coast of Tasmania, and then we hit this southerly buster, and we were in 60 knots for about between 10 and 15 hours. At sea, there's not much time for a drink, and tired crewmen would prefer something hot any time. But this is the time to celebrate and relax. And it's time for the mascot to go into pride of place on the starboard shroud. Now, I think this race is tremendous because it gives you so much opportunity to learn about sailing because the wind fluctuates so much, the weather, the clouds and the sea, and it's, uh, it's worth going into. Sarah's t-shirt. <laughs> I was a sensation. I was a sensation. Back on the Tasmanian coast, Huey, as yachtsmen call the wind god, was not letting up. And while in Flinders it was plenty of fun, the yachtsmen weren't forgetting those still sailing. They had my greatest admiration because um, they've got to carry more water and more stores. And, uh, of course, it's never comfortable at sea. I don't care what people say. You're always wet and you're miserable and you're tired. You're sure to sleep. And uh, I've got a lot of admiration for these fellas. Like most top yachtsmen, Rolly Tasker can remember most moments of all his races. The triumphs and the disappointments, the good times and the bad, the lucky breaks and the frustrations. This race was no exception. Yeah. We lost 12 hours yesterday, yesterday morning, down to the northwest coast of Tasmania yesterday morning. Light winds. And we went backwards and forwards, and the pinnacle there, back and forwards, we lost 12 hours dead. Yeah. Hard, hard on the wind. Hard we, on the, the tide had us, and we were going back and forward. As the smaller yachts continued battling Huey, Challenge was looking set for a win on handicap. With 100 miles to go, she had until 9.40 the next morning to beat Cisco, and she would have to be becalmed or disabled to lose, while the rest of the fleet was still at the bottom of Tasmania, sailing quickly. Aquila continued around the southwest of Tasmania, set for third on handicap. At one minute to midnight, the sloop from Sandringham crossed the line, easily beating her deadline to take handicap honours from Cisco. Challenge had taken five days, 13 hours, 59 minutes and 9 seconds to sail the Great Circle. And it was a triumph for the new yacht. She was more than nine and a half hours inside the deadline to beat Siska on handicap. And over a thousand people waited to welcome them home. The race had been the toughest test for the new yacht and she'd passed with flying colours. For those on board, it was a fitting thrill to be greeted by so many waiting to share their success. Matt Syker, Force 10, mate. A little bit of masochism. <laughs> you got to believe in it. The win in the Great Circle was especially satisfying for skipper Lou Abrahams. It was another indication, and under by far the toughest conditions, of just what his new yacht could do. And what was the hardest breeze you had on the, on the trip, Lou? Oh, I think uh, down the east coast uh, towards Tasman Light, that was the uh, hardest. Uh, oh, from probably uh, from probably Turrible to uh, 
down, down around Tasman there, but, uh, that was the hardest squeeze. That wasn't bad, like uh, earlier there was a big season, but, uh, you know, the short, confused season was a problem. Again it was out with the beer and champagne and time to relax. For the skipper, such races are particularly hard as they're solely responsible for their craft and the safety of their crew. Races like this great circle are pretty sleepless times for skippers like Lou Abrahams and especially satisfying if success comes as well as the pleasure of sailing. It was particularly good to beat Superstar after so many miles. We knew he was pretty close behind us, but um, he has to give us a bit of time and uh, we, uh, so we, we reckon as long as we stayed in front of him we're pretty safe. Two hours and ten minutes later, Superstar crossed the finish line. Third to finish and second on handicap, while Aquila later finished third on handicap, pushing Siska out to fourth. <laughs> Even after two o'clock in the morning, there were hundreds of people to welcome her crew home. Very satisfying for the crew as they finished the Golden Police Great Circle Yacht Race. I'll get a lift back here if I can. Fortune. Oh, can't I? I want you right on the pier. Where's Timo? I'm seeing his face. Find your hand there, Russ. You won't be far away from me. How does he look? You won't be far away. Here you go. Hey, look at you. Hey, Rat. Hey, Rat. Hey, Rat. Doesn't blow like it used to. Don't trust that bloody hand, Lee. John, get on board now. Get on board now. I'll be in charge of this. We're happy with our performance going down towards Bank Strait there. A good bit of a spinnaker run. And then it came in and it kept on coming in. And as you saw from the helicopter, we got more and more of it. We had Lou Abrams in challenge alongside us a lot of the time, which was good because we knew we had to... Well, you were ahead of uh, Lou for quite some time. We were ahead time. of Lou for quite a while. Uh, when it heavy, got very heavy down towards um, Storm Bay, we stayed out a bit and Lou went and that's when he got the break on us because right. we tried like... You know what the catch well, here is. Here well, he is. Here he is. The fastest well man done. in Victoria. Well done. done. Well done. <laughs> Where did you get the, the hardest breeze? Was it on the east coast? The hardest breeze was on the east coast, well, coming down towards South Bruny. Well, it's amazing when you think back to the Hobart race, only a week before, yeah. when we were all but calmed on the east coast, and then you struck the toughest weather of the whole well, race on the east coast. We had it reading 60 on our wind thing and jammed up, so it must have been gusting over 70. The seas were not all that bad, but Jesus, I've never seen so much wind in all my life, and it just kept going. You know, there was no, um, no beginning or end to it, but the blokes all handled it very well. Getting around Matsuka, a lot of wind, but I think all this talk about it being a dangerous race is all a whole heap of bullshit. You okay? Yeah, all right, Kay. I'm just trying to get out of the water. Someone's coming. What are you doing? I fell in. <laughs> <laughs> Told you it's too cold down there. After every tough yacht race, there's someone who slips and others who swear it's their last. Ask me if I'm going again. <laughs> well, you've done it twice now. Last year I said, no way. I went, definitely no way this time. You're going south again? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Never, ever again. The race will go on. I know that many people who say at this time, never again, will be looking for berths for the next year. <laughs> To all the competitors, we offer our sincere congratulations. It was a very hard race, and I think you will agree with me that any trophies which are awarded to the owners, skippers and crews this evening are well deserved. It's often hard sailing. After all, the Great Circle is the most challenging race on Australia's yachting calendar. A test for yachts and an unforgettable experience for those who accept the challenge.